and welcome to Picturing Mexican America. I'm Marissa Lopez. I'm professor of English and Chicano studies at UC at UC. Together with a crew of researchers and coders, I am building Picturing Mexican America. Uh, we're making a mobile app that is going to use geodata to display images of 19th century Mexican Los Angeles to uh, users. So find and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook uh, to learn cool stuff and to stay updated on the app. So here at Picturing Mexican America, we recognize that Gabrielino Tongva peoples is the traditional caretakers of Tobangar, that's the Los Angeles basin and the South Channel Islands. But we are also grappling with the fact that this land once was, it still is, and will probably always be Mexican. So I've had a few conversations with artists and scholars uh, here on Instagram uh, about how the past is always with us. And I'm gonna keep doing that um, for, I'm gonna keep doing that. Uh, but today, I'm gonna do something a little different. Today is June 5th, 2020. And today, I'm gonna start reading a book. I'm gonna read this book. It's called, well, it's backwards. It's called The Squatter and the Dawn. Uh, and this is a book that I know like the back of my hand. I've read it many times. I teach it all the time. I've written about it, published articles about it. It is one of the most significant works of 19th century Mexican American literature. So starting today, I'm going to periodically read a chapter or two uh, here with you and, and talk about it. If you have questions, if you have comments, um, please <laughs> comment or ask your questions. Uh, and we'll post these videos to IGTV. But books, okay, great, yay, we, we like books. But why now, why today? Again, today's June 5th, 2020. Police are killing black folks. Los Angeles is burning. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. Millions and millions of people are out of work. Is some old book really all I've got for you? Yep, <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you why. Uh, so there's a couple ways to think about reading and real life. And I've seen and heard a lot of people talking recently about art as distraction. Lose yourself in a good story, in the beauty of culture, etc., etc. And you know, that's fine. Uh, but that's not why I think reading that's not why I think reading is important. And it is sure as hell not why I'm an English professor. I did not dedicate my life to distracting people. A lot of you probably watched The Handmaid's Tale, and so you know that in Gilead, I see my live video is paused. Ah, oh, I'm back. So you know, if you watch The Handmaid's Tale, that in Gilead, it's illegal for women to read, right? They cut off a finger for the first offense, they cut off the whole hand for the second offense. Uh, so <laughs> why? I mean, sure, Gilead's a hot, crazy mess. Uh, but what's so dangerous about reading? And Gilead may be a hot, crazy mess, but it's not that much crazier than US history. A lot of you probably know that it used to be illegal in this country to teach an enslaved person to read. You could go to jail, or worse, for giving an enslaved person that gift. And let me tell you something. That's not because plantation owners, slave owners, were looking for a distraction-free work environment. That's not it. Teaching an enslaved person to read was a crime because reading, because art, makes new worlds possible. And studying art and literature gives you the skills to bring those worlds into being, to imagine the unimaginable and make it happen. Reading is important. Literature is important because it shows us how to see and think about the world differently, how to be visionary problem solvers, and to communicate those solutions effectively. <laughs> and goodness knows we need all of that we can get right now. Reading is not a distraction from the real. It is one of the most powerful tools we have for learning how to change the real. And this is more or less what I say in the conclusion to my most recent book. This is my book, Racial Imminence. It just came out uh, this past August. You can find it wherever fine paperbacks are sold. Uh, and so what I just said to you, I say um, in the conclusion to this book, I'm gonna read you a little bit of it now. Uh, I wrote a good chunk of this book 
in the aftermath of Donald Trump's election to the presidency. And I found myself in that time thinking a lot about how, about how, as I put it in the book, how, and I'm quoting myself now, to grapple with the vulnerability of Latinidad, how to move through the world under a president who calls Mexicans rapists, criminals, drug dealers, and enemies of the United States. What kind of ethical future can we hope for, really, when so many bodies are threatened? What now, indeed? And what good does reading do anyone? This is the question that I just asked you a few minutes ago. Today, June 5th, 2020, I'm going to read a book, but why? So what good does reading do anyone? Where does reading fit? Why I think about literature? Again, I'm still reading from my own book. Throughout racial imminence, and again, I'm reading the conclusion to my book. So throughout racial imminence, I've argued for reading as an interaction of body and text. In the preceding chapters, I demonstrate reading as producing an experience wherein Latinidad can be sensed and perceived, wherein race is imminent and productive. I have challenged my own readers to think of reading not as representing, but as conducting sensory experiences between entities, as generating feelings and making space for radical hope. Reading in this way asks us to linger with rather than interpret the text. Granting the imminence of race reconfigures the space and time of reading and writing. It posits both as world-making performances that reimagine the social. And so now I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Not that I made any money off of this book, but so now I'm doing uh, what I say reading does in this book. Let's reimagine the world and read together. And so like I said, I'm going to start reading this book, uh, and this will be an ongoing project. Um, I don't want to say too much about this book before we get into it. This, uh, The Squatter and the Dawn, it was written in, well, it was published in 1885 by a woman named Maria Amparo Ruiz de Burton. Sorry, I'm adjusting my phone here. So written by Ruiz de Burton. She was a wealthy, well-connected, very well-educated lady, and she is one of the first Mexican-American writers. Uh, to be writing and publishing in English in the United States. This book is written in 1885 by Ruiz de Burton. She's a wealthy, well-connected, very well-educated uh, woman. She's the first Mexican-American, one of the first uh, Mexican-Americans to be writing and publishing in English in the United States. Squatter and the Dawn, one of the most significant works of 19th century Mexican-American literary history. So the novel covers the intertwined fates of the Alamars, the Darrells, and the Mechelens. These are the three uh, main families that this book is about, and the book follows them in the years immediately following the Mexican-American War. So immediately following the end of the war in 1848. The Mexican-American War uh, was very controversial, even at the time. Through this war, the United States more than doubled its territory. It's how we got to stretch from sea to shining sea. The United States acquired California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, Colorado, parts of Wyoming, all as a result of this war. Like I said, it was a really controversial war. Uh, Henry David Thoreau famously did not want his taxes to go to funding uh, such a war. This is why he spent the night in jail. He wrote resistance to civil government in part because of his opposition to the Mexican-American War. He, like a lot of people at the time, felt like the war was a ploy uh, by slaveholding states to incorporate more territory that would uh, give them a slaveholding majority in the Senate. So James Polk was president at the time that the United States went in into this war, and people, a lot of people thought that he provoked uh, war with Mexico and that he tricked Congress into authorizing it. The congressional record uh, for the weeks leading up to the war is really juicy if you're into that kind of thing. So May of 1846. Just having no end of internet troubles today, but I'm back. Uh, so there's lots of editions of this book. This uh, yellow one is the, from Arte Publico Press. Uh, this Penguin Classics did an edition as well. Uh, the Arte Publico edition is the first uh, recovery uh, of this book. It was published um, originally in 1992. Uh, and if you follow Picturing Mexican America on Instagram, then you know that in February we were at the uh, recovery projects, Arte Publico's recovery projects, uh, biennial conference in Houston. So that just happened in February. It was one of the last things that I got to do before uh, the entire country shut down. Uh, and the recovery project has put out a lot of 19th century, early 20th century, uh, Hispanic, as they call it, uh, literature. And they're, they're really a, a force um, in the field. They are the field. 
Uh, and so this edition, put together, edited, and with an introduction by Rosario Sanchez and Beatriz Pita, uh, it's a really important book. They did a lot of amazing, uh, groundbreaking archival work, uh, for which all of us in the field are very grateful. When I teach the book, I prefer uh, the Penguin edition, and this is the one I would recommend if you're so uh, uh, compelled by my dramatic reading of the first chapter or so. Um, I would recommend this one. It's got uh, better notes, and uh, I like the introduction better, for what it's worth. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm just going to read today, I'm just going to read the first two chapters. Uh, this is just 13 pages, and these first two chapters are where you're introduced to the two main chapters, the Daryls and the Alamars. And as I said, I welcome your comments and your questions. Um, so we're just going to dig right in. Mm -hmm. 